curious how you see it, uh, Osagi. Maybe you can share a little bit about uh, yourself and then how you see uh, both the work that we were a part of on this recharge and recovery initiative, as well as sort of what you see as the prospects for the city and specifically, um, you know, the building on the cell and gene therapy expertise that has has been emerging over the last, uh, you know, this, this last generation. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and welcome to everyone uh, that is participating in this, uh, in this session. Uh, as Jeff said, both of us are very pleased to be part of this and, and to have, um, to engage in this discussion. Um, my name is Osage Masage, and um, I'm involved, um, founder and uh, senior managing partner of a private equity venture capital firm uh, based in Philadelphia that is focused exclusively uh, on the life sciences space uh, called PIPV Capital. And we've been involved in the biotech, in the pharma uh, space uh, for um, almost uh, 20 years now. And um, we really enjoy the space. Um, um, Jeff, just to uh, uh, buttress what you were saying, both Jeff and I served as the co-chair um, with another uh, dear colleague of the life, of the, uh, life sciences uh, subcommittee of the uh, cities and states effort uh, for recovery and recharge. And what was crystal clear uh, was the, the pivotal role that Philadelphia uh, uh, holds in that sector, particularly in cell and gene therapy. And one of the things that was unique, you know, why Philadelphia? There's been some very interesting work done. It started by Professor Allen at MIT, and then others from Harvard, um, uh, the economists, a whole bunch of other research institutes um, validated the original research, which was essentially showing that there's a correlation between creativity and proximity of those who work together. And so why Philadelphia? Well, because it's happening right here in Philadelphia. <laughs> the gene and the cell therapy uh, that we're talking about is happening here. The researchers are, are here in our great universities. Um, and that close proximity uh, leads to creativity. And, 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 and we've already seen the results of that. Spark is a classical example of the output of that kind of collaboration. So we're very excited. We think Philadelphia is unique in its own right, and we hope that we can continue to build on that. No, no, Asagi, when we started, uh, you know, thanks for that. And as we, when we started the conversations um, as a task force, um, you know, we began, the, you know, I think the initial meetings were probably sometime, my recollection is right, sometime in the late spring, um, and, uh, and, and preceded what has been certainly a, a, a righteous um, uh, and, and worthwhile debate um, and discussion and sort of raising of, of the issues of social justice. Um, you know, maybe you can share a little bit of your thoughts about how you saw, even prior to some of those, the national dialogue um, uh, escalating, um, but how the, the, the group really took upon itself to think about uh, the role in recharge uh, and recovery of this economy in bring, being broad-based? Uh, well, look, I mean, the reality is this. I'm a very competitive person, <laughs> as you are, <laughs> Jeff. Yep. And, you know, we competitive folks love to win. Um, I'm also a very much uh, committed capitalist in terms of believing that there's an economic model that can be very constructive. Um, and if that is the case, then this, the, the issue of diversity, I always find fascinating um, because I think many people misunderstand uh, how they should be thinking about diversity. Um, too many times it's talked about as if it's a nice thing to do, some form of charity, a, 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 a form of kindness. Um, it might be that, but from my perspective, it's infinitely more than that. Um, uh, it's, I, and I usually use a metaphor that makes it easy for everyone to understand. Um, and it happens to come from my mother's people, the Yorubas. And the metaphor is simple because we all have hands. So it says, take a look at your hand. And there are three elements to the metaphor. Uh, one is that if you notice, each of your fingers, each of your digits uh, is different. So um, nature has already built into you a, a high level of diversity because each finger is different. And not only are they different, they're independent. So you can move your fingers uh, indiv uh, individually. 
The second part of the, uh, of the proverb is it points out that what holds your fingers together happens to be your palm. And your palm is larger than your individual fingers. So it is possible to have that diversity in your fingers, but have a common cause that is bigger than an individual finger, which happens to be your palm. But the third part of the proverb, which I think is the most powerful, is that it points out that when your hand is in this strongest position, it's when it is either a fist or a handshake. In both instances, all your fingers and your palm work together. So that's the way I tend to think about diversity. Um, uh, it would be very strange if all your fingers were of the same length and breadth and width. <laughs> you would not be functional. It would be very strange if you didn't have something that held it all together, like your palm. And it will weaken your strength if you cannot uh, uh, make a fist or a, hand, uh, a handshake. So diversity is about winning. It's about bringing different ideas to the table. Um, and those different ideas is what leads to creativity. And it's that creativity that leads to economic success. So um, you know that's always been our perspective. And it was very gratifying to see that our subcommittee everyone resonated to that. And we came up with some suggestions on how to um, implement and build on that concept uh, uh, during this process. You know, I think uh, from my, ob my observation, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the types of businesses that we're talking about that are in life sciences, I mean, they, they start and begin on innovation. So at the end of the day, you know, everything is about uh, innovation and innovation um, whether it's in the lab, which of course is where most ideas in, in biotech, you know, can originate. Um, they can originate in lots of places, but often they originate there. But innovation, as at least we found at Spark, uh, not only should be there in the lab, it also needs to uh, proceed through the other parts of developing a medicine for patients. Um, but whether you are talking about innovating in how you might bring a therapy to patients, how you might conduct a clinical trial, how you might manufacture, um, a novel cell or gene therapy, or how you might research and discover one, uh, you need creativity in that process. And sort of creativity, in my estimation, um, yeah, certainly we all kind of, I think, um, idealize sometimes with the, the idea that, that you have one person sitting in a room who comes up with a great idea, but that is almost never the case. You know, it is almost a, always a group exercise. And what I've observed is the best of those ideas come from uh, of, of, of multiple different ideas sort of banging uh, off, off of each other, if you will. And what better way to do that than to have people who come from different uh, backgrounds, whatever that might mean. They might come from, uh, they, they might, might, might represent different uh, ethnic backgrounds. They might represent just frankly living in a different part of, uh, of this country, living in, coming from another part uh, of the world altogether and see something different and, and sort of pick out that insight from their background, from their experience that, uh, that comes to, comes together in that creative process. And so this industry in particular, I think fundamentally um, mm -hmm. uh, to win, you have to have phenomenal creativity and to have mm -hmm. phenomenal creativity, you have to have diverse thought and diverse insights. And so, um, yeah, I, I too was uh, excited by the, not just the ideals we were talking about as a subcommittee, uh, but some of the specific tangible actions uh, that, that could come out of that. Maybe you could say a few words about uh, which of those specific ideas you thought you know, came about that, uh, that are tangible, can be seen as having immediate impact, because um, there were a lot of good ones that came out of our discussions. Yeah, indeed. I, I, I would probably just, I mean, there were a lot of really great ideas, but I would probably just focus on two that I thought um, were yeah. both uh, achievable and uh, things that will immediately have a positive impact on us. Yep. The first one is the issue of intentionality. In other words, if we want to shift, if we want to make a move, if we want to create a truly um, a successful enterprise um, and tap into what you were just talking about, the creativity of different perspectives, then we have to be intentional about it. It's not something that happens if we don't make a conscious effort to make that happen. Um, yeah. And it's relatively clear that historically, we know that is the case. We know that things uh, have been in a particular way, and they haven't changed in the so-called normal process, and, and we needed an actual intervention. So one of the things that I thought was 
very good was we had an open discussion about that. And yeah. the consequence of that was that members of our subcommittee committed to intentionally seeking to diversify their workforce. Um, mm -hmm. First, starting with diversifying their, um, uh, their pool of candidates for, mm -hmm. uh, for unique positions. And that is an intentional act. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. much higher likelihood that you will be successful in diversifying, uh, diversifying your workforce if you had actually had a pool of people you were selecting from that itself was diverse. So that yeah. is something that is clear, unambiguous. We all made a commitment to doing that, and I'm very excited about that. The second aspect of that is part of the correlation also, which is, is part of the continuum in many regards. You know, we live in a capitalist country, uh, and we run a capitalist system. As I said, I'm a committed capitalist. Um, and what is fascinating about that is the importance of capital. You cannot have a capitalist system if you don't have capital in play. And one of the areas where it's crystal clear um, we have not done well in, in, in making sure that we have true diversity and, 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 and an integrated economy is in the provision of capital uh, particularly for people of color uh, and, and for women also. Um, and so we, we talked about maybe the need, following on the first issue of intentionality, the need yeah. of having an intentional fund um, yeah. that is focused on making sure that capital is made available uh, to people of color and to increase the diversity of entrepreneurs who get capital so that they can participate in the capitalist system. So those are just two examples of the kind of things we discussed, which I thought was fantastic. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I can just say from my perspective, um, you know, I think that intentionality is really important. And, you, you know, I think that the reality is, you know, um, you've got, you have, you have people trying to, you know, prosecute and to your point, trying, trying to win in whatever their endeavor might be. And if you take the talent point, for example, um, you know, people may tend to go back you know, to the same source of talent uh, pool, or they might come back to the same people that they have worked with before. And so, you know, you can create this uh, without sort of an intentional effort. You can create uh, something that just continues to sort of, you know, self-fulfill on itself because people just look to the same same networks, perhaps the same recruitment firms, so on and so forth. So, you know, I think in particular, some of the ideas that were discussed in the forum, even discussed sort of offline, you and I have had some very good conversations about that. Um, and uh, uh, and have and have sort of opened up you know new new avenues and new channels for thinking about uh, uh, talent um, on one hand you know the other topic that I thought was was really um, an important one that was brought up and, and I think covered well was really around procurement right our businesses um, you know procure um, a substantial amount of goods and services um, because we're buying lab equipment and we're buying uh, services to to qualify that lab equipment, and uh, there is both an opportunity for both helping the uh, local economy by focusing uh, that procurement efforts locally, uh, but there's also can be an equal um, and important uh, effort to continue to develop and, and support businesses and entrepreneurs that may not necessarily be in the specific business of discovering a molecule, but might be supporting that. And you and I have talked about sort of the size of that entire ecosystem that supports that. And, and you know, what, what if we, again, open our eyes, open our networks, open our perspective, um, you know, to additional entrepreneurs who might be a black or brown uh, uh, entrepreneur who started a business that, can, that we can procure services from. So I think there were a lot of good and tangible initiatives and I think that intentionality I think is the is the right point whether it's in talent whether it's uh, with respect to capital whether it's with respect to procurement um, I think all of these are are areas right for not just again back to the theme helping the local economy continue to to uh, uh, rebound and recover but do so in a very you know broad-based way and where you also have the ability to take advantage of um, all the diversity and uh, and creativity that's inherent in that diversity Right. And, and just to buttress what you, what you just said, uh, you know, I always uh, keep in mind, I, I keep on coming back to the business angle. Um, you actually get better prices <laughs> if you broaden yeah. your 
supply chain uh, 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 participants, yeah. you actually end up getting better prices. So it's a smart business thing to do, yeah. not not just a nice thing to do. Um, I, I'm switching uh, gears slightly to, we, you know, I, you and I have had some interesting conversations about COVID-19 and, and I think all of us um, uh, individuals, whether it's in our personal lives and our professional lives, I think are probably noticing, you know, almost each and every day, just how, uh, just how uh, impactful uh, the, just the entirety of the, the pandemic is having on all of those. I mean, look, we're, we're interacting to get today over a virtual forum as opposed to be sitting together. So, um, you know, it, it's been interesting to think about how does how does something like this pandemic uh, change um, and change acts uh, in the way we conduct business? And which of those do you think are here to stay? And we've had some good dialogue and, and discussion about that. I'm curious how you're thinking about it today. It's an, evol an evolving one that I'm constantly thinking about. Right. You know, um... So two different angles there. One is we just talked about what has been proven in some very interesting research uh, from MIT and Harvard and the like about physical proximity leading to a higher level of creativity. Yep. Um, however, during this period, uh, a good chunk of us have had to uh, interact remotely. We've had social yep. distancing. We've used this platform that we're yep. using right now, some form of yep. video teleconference. So it's going to be fascinating to see what the sociologists and the psychiatrists and psychologists end up telling us. You yep. know, is, is, is proximity more like I'm talking to you now? Is that yep. good enough? Or do I physically have to be in the same space with you? And, and I yep. think that... Um, one of the things that we're going to have to figure out is the full impact of this uh, as to the, the level of creativity. The second thing that strikes me is that it really, this whole COVID, uh, unfortunate COVID uh, pandemic situation has removed a lot of, has resolved and removed a lot of illusions. So the illusion that somehow you can't function if you are not physically in the office I think that has gone, you know. So there was a time where um, someone needed to take a maternity leave. It was a it was a big issue. You had to ask permission. It had to be a big deal. If you had a, a member of the family that you had to take care of, um, and you needed to work from home, it was a big deal to get the permission. Well, we've proven <laughs> that that is actually that ought no longer to be an issue. I think this is well proven during this period. Um, the other thing that he showed um, in the same vein is the significant disparity that exists in our uh, country and in our city um, based on people's educational level, the type of work they do. Um, um, so access to health care um, uh, and, and those who have to be, quote unquote, frontline workers, all of a sudden they got more exposed to the virus. Uh, and yep. the pandemic, simply because they were providing services for us. And that spanned everything from medical providers to people who helped in our grocery stores. So there's a lot we learned. It's like the tide went out, and we got to see what was on the, she on the seashore. And, and so there's a lot we can learn from that process. Yeah, I will say, I mean, you, you mentioned it before. I, I think the thing that... Um you know, is, is uh, really encouraging to me as you think about the, the Philadelphia economy, um, uh, you know, rebounding from this and, and the right focus that has been placed on uh, looking to make this uh, city, uh, you know, the, the top cell and gene therapy hub um, in the globe is that idea of proximity, right? At the end of the day, the, the people who work in the research facilities, the people who work in the manufacturing sites um, I mean, that was the entire basis for why we, when we started Spark, we located in West Philadelphia, and we now here we are now seven years later, uh, six buildings and locations later, and 200,000 square feet of space later, um, uh, with with that being where we're located, because we still, even today, as we've grown and have had less need to have the direct connection 
in every aspect of the business with, let's say, a University of Pennsylvania or a Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as we might have at the beginning, uh, there's still so much to be gained from that interaction and that sort of walking down the, the, the street. And so I think those aspects of our business um, will continue to flourish as a result of that. The interesting thing will be the aspects of the business um, which are uh, less directly you know, uh, related to uh, to the the research and manufacturing, but I think it holds uh, you know huge promise for uh, growth, in particular in those those areas and disciplines. Which at the end of the day, you know the the research and manufacturing of these types of novel therapies, you know, is at the heart of everything we do. That's the, the that's the creative um, innovation uh, uh, origination of the process. Um, I, I'd love to I talk about. Uh, I might yeah, mention one more thing in that same topic, which is the it, it, this whole COVID situation has also emphasized where we need to strengthen our um, uh, shared infrastructure. So, yeah. for instance, this whole ability to actually use the internet and the ability to use video conferencing, you know, yeah. we take it for granted, but that is not. Um, uh, equally available across our whole community. And it, it happened with education, it's happened with our businesses. Clearly, we need to strengthen our um, access uh, to the internet uh, across the board, irrespective of social class and economic um, uh, uh, status. And, and, and the good news is that um, there are already people stepping up to help in that regard. Uh, but I think that's gonna be very important. Yep. From from a uh, from a partnership perspective, I mean, what do you, what do you see? Uh, I have some views on this, but what what do you think are some of the most important sort of partnerships um, that uh, Philadelphia um, has in advancing its life sciences? And uh, I mean, I don't mean you can call out specific examples, or just generally, I'm curious your perspective on on partnership. Well, the first one that we've that we've proven through the uh, uh, recharge and, and, and recovery effort is bringing all the stakeholders to the table. You know, dialogue yeah. is good. <laughs> dialogue is good, um, yeah. and and so to bring members of the business community, uh, members of the scientific community, members of the academic community, uh, uh, you know, our supporters in government, uh, both state and federal and and local. Um, you know, to bring everyone to the table, I think, uh, was a very crucial thing. I think that partnership creates real value. Uh, the second one uh, is, a corollary, uh, is a corollary of that. My mother's people say that the reason God gave us two ears and one mouth uh, <laughs> is so that we can, we can listen twice as much as we talk. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you bring all these people to the table, um, we, have to, we ourselves have to learn how to be aggressive listeners because so, so many of us have been very successful in our own little echo chambers, and our ears have been tuned in such a way that we cannot hear the voice or the views of others. And you know, being able to learn that through bringing everyone together, I think was, again, another crucial partnership. And then you get the actual deal making. You, know, you, you get the actual um, uh, uh, interactions where, you know, parties can see how working together can create more economic value for themselves, new technology, new products. So I think there's a series of learnings uh, uh, that leads to partnerships um, uh, that, can be, that have been and will continue to be very uh, productive for our community. Maybe lastly, just to close, and I know we're gonna have questions from, uh, from the audience as well. Um, you know, I think with anything, I, I think any moment in, in business in general, um, I think uh, challenges, um, you know, I, I tend to believe bring out sort of the best um, in people. Um, and, uh, um, and I think when led correctly, uh, they can they can bring out the best in people and the best ideas and, and, and frankly, things that come about that you might have not have seen in the absence of a challenge. So, I mean, what do you think about uh, this period uh, for Philadelphia, I mean, it's clearly a challenging period, not just for the city, for the country. Um, what what do you hope, what do you already see emerging out of it? We've probably touched on some of these themes, but maybe do you want to leave us with a few thoughts on what uh, what challenges you think are going to lead to opportunities that, uh, um, that we'll be talking about in two years or five years as having been the silver lining um, out of this, uh, out of what has been a, a challenging 2020 for sure for many people. I think one of the things that happened 
particularly at the very beginning, in the first, you know, two to four weeks of, of, yeah. of the of virus, is that it forced all of us to actually slow down. <laughs> it forced all of us to just catch our breath. We were all stuck at home. And for many people, it led to uh, uh, an introspective, reflective period where they really thought about what is really important? What does it mean to be part of a community? What is our community? Um, uh, what does it mean for others? How do they see the world? And I think that, you know, as we get back into the holy belly of, of our normal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, lives, I really do think that long, long term, that reflective moment that we had for those first two or four weeks um, would be very helpful. I think it's going to spur a range of additional ideas. And I think it's made some people much more empathetic than they were before. And I think that's an yep. important development. And, yeah, and, and by the way, that happened globally. It wasn't just in Philadelphia. Globally, we thought about, the, you know, we started realizing that all of us, that there's only one species, the human species. There's only one race, the human race. And all of us yep. were affected. And I think it was helpful. Yeah, I, I, well, uh, I'm going to turn to the first question here from the audience in a second. But I would say, from my perspective, what I found really interesting was, we, you know, we obviously concluded a, um, a merger uh, or really an acquisition of Spark by Roche at the end of 2019, and so we came into 2020 uh, with an expectation that one of our one of our uh, big challenges in front of us was going to be how do you maintain the culture um, of a smaller, nimble. Uh, startup company that had done, you know, some really, um, I think, groundbreaking uh, work and first gene therapy approved the way in which we brought that to market with some novel pricing and payment models um, and all the research that we were doing, as well as, you know, of course, the pr first approved manufacturing site in the middle of West Philadelphia for any, you know, gene therapy. Um, so we had done all that. And the question was, how do you maintain that? And, uh, and it's sort of one thing to reemphasize the mission and vision statements, um, and your values as a company and sort of try to find ways to communicate those again. But what we found was that the that actually the pandemic and then subsequently um, all the the, the uh, social uh, justice um, uh, dialogue was gave us a chance to not just talk about those values, but actually act consistent with them. And so you know, I, I, I personally believe uh, that it's given us this opportunity to really show the, the people that uh, were excited about the next chapter of Spark, those that were excited about joining the next chapter of Spark, uh, that we actually do live those values in terms of the way that we, we thought about um, the safety and welfare of our employees, the way we thought about the intentionality of trying to, to, to win even better by, by improving upon uh, how we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our organization. So I think at the end of the day, it's about your actions. And for me, I think it's been this uh, great exogenous shock that's allowed us to, to double down and demonstrate you know, that we, we act consistent with those values. So um, that's at least what I've seen out of it, which has been really uh, an exciting uh, part, I think, of this year and a silver lining. Uh, so the question uh, from the audience, first question is, could you map out the lay of the land of cell, gene, and immunotherapies in the Philadelphia area and what you are seeing in this space? Um, so I'll, I'll, maybe I'll ask, you, you can start and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll chime in after you. Well, look, I, I, number one, we've already talked a little bit about that. The science is happening here. And not only is the science happening here, but what is beautiful about this particular moment is that we're having multiple shots on goals. Yep. So what Spark is doing is really cool. What is happening um, uh, um, uh, at Penn, for instance, with cancer, uh, is really, really, uh, 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 with Professor John, is really, really cool. Um, what is happening across the board uh, in our scientific community is really cool. What is happening with immunotherapy and even the vaccine uh, 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 discussions about DNA vaccines is really, really yeah. cool. So we are creating a critical mass. And I think that is important. So multiple shots of goals, immun immunotherapy, cell therapy, gene therapy, cancer, um, multiple therapeutic areas. That, I think, is really, really cool. And that critical mass 
um, is something that we're going to continue to build on. Yeah, I think. I mean, I couldn't couldn't agree more. I mean, I think one of the other on the other couple of dimensions I would add to that is you've got, you know, you've got companies now of different sizes. So you know, the the fortunate thing for us is we're 500 people and we're going to keep growing pretty dramatically. And we have sort of a different capital base now to do that with uh, a parent organization in Roche. You still have you know new companies being formed. Um, I believe there's now at least 30 different cell and gene therapy companies um, in the in the Philadelphia area. You also have all the other uh, an increasing level of investment um, in all the other providers that support that industry. So, you know, more interest in capital from a, a CMO perspective, more interest in capital um, and attractiveness from a CRO perspective. Um, so I, I think all of those are the right uh, trends because people, to your point, are seeing that it isn't sort of a single shot. Um, but that they want to be there, especially in those supporting parts of the industry, because there's opportunity in multiple different locations. And also thought there was an interesting theme that came out of uh, our task force. Uh, John Epstein mentioned uh, the idea of we think a lot of this as this cell and gene therapy, but emerging out of both of those different areas, which they're, they're you know, to the layman, they may seem similar. They're actually quite different in terms of the way we go about uh, a, a gene therapy, certainly an in vivo gene transfer strategy versus sort of the, uh, the CAR-T therapies, those are quite different. But the thing that they actually have in common um, is this, this sort of increasing need to deeply understand the immune system and this idea of immune health. And that, that increasing what you're also, what I think we're also observing is that there is a deep level of expertise um, in the academic environment in Philadelphia around immunology and immune health, uh, which, is, which to your point is also now being seen in reaction to COVID-19 in the context of, of vaccine uh, development and, and people appreciating just the depth there. So I think that's a really important critical aspect from a scientific perspective um, of these two dis you know, different areas in cell therapy and gene therapy because they have this similar uh, challenge and opportunity to really uh, think about um, immune health in that context. And the I second question we have. I will, yeah. I, before we leave that, I will mention one more thing. Um, we were involved in, we, with one of our portfolio companies at the very early stages of the monoclonal antibody development yeah. when maps were being made and that kind of thing. And it's fascinating to me because it's deja vu all over again, right? Yeah. <laughs> Whereby, you know, the science with MAPS was way ahead. You know, we, we all got the targeted therapy. We we're all very excited. And what held most MAP companies up was the actual manufacturing. Yep. Was the, how the heck do you actually make this thing at scale? Yep. Okay. Yep. And it took a long time and a lot of money for that issue to be resolved. In the case of, C, uh, 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 of gene and cell therapy, I think we've learned a little bit from that experience with MABS. And so now you've got some companies that are actually focused, I think, much earlier on, on how do you manufacture, how do you manufacture a skill, and how do you make sure it's compliant with all the FDA regulations. And that is another piece that I think is very important. And we are building the capacity for that in Philadelphia. And that will attract even more of that type of business here because you have to make you have to make the genes, you have to make the cells, you have to make yep. the methodology of delivering also. Yeah, no, it, it's huge, hugely important. One of the things that we saw as a, as an advantage um, in the new corporate structure being a part of Roche was being able to make even more aggressive investments in that that type of foundational platform investments and physical you know infrastructure of manufacturing ahead of. When you might get every de-risking event that might that you might ideally want to have if you were, let's say, in a public company context. So, you know, we we're going to be dramatically increasing the the amount of capital investment. You've even, I mean, publicly some of it's already even become visible. Where we've taken some additional spaces on top of the one that we already had. Um, shifting to a different question, uh, which is one I know you know you and I have talked about and you touched on earlier, but how can we create more diverse capital? I think it's a it's a great and direct question. Um, and one that uh, you know, I know is near and dear to your heart. Well, uh, I would start off from what I said earlier on. We have to be intentional about it. It's not going to happen mm -hmm. on its own. We have to be intentional about it. Um, we've, we've had a capitalist system for two, 300 years. Uh, <laughs> and um, if, if right now, what, 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 what does the statistics tell us? 
uh, it says that less than 1% of venture capital, cap uh, capital goes to uh, minorities. Less than 1%. Yeah. So it's not going to happen by itself, right? So we and have to be it's what, it's like 3% 3, 3 or so for women, I think is yes, something around two, that. Yeah. 2 to 3% for women. And, yeah. and so here's the way I approach that. Um, it's very simple. I, I'm, I'm a, an investor. That's I, that I have a private equity firm. That's what we do. And I think about the paint-up opportunity that actually exists. I mean, think about it. You've starved, you've starved a, two huge sectors, women and people of color, particularly African-American, of capital funding. So yeah. unless you believe that there is, there is a paucity of creativity and intelligence within those two groups, unless you believe that, um, then you are fine. But if you don't believe that, and I don't, I think that is actually silly, and I think data shows us that's not the case, then think about the opportunities that actually exist to invest in those sectors. You're going to get a much higher quality return, much higher level of creativity, um, and it makes a smart business to invest in that sector. So I'm really excited about that. And, and I think that is an opportunity that more, more and more people are realizing exist. So we have to be intentional about it. We should set up a fund that is focused on that, um, even if it's a demonstration fund, just to prove out the hypothesis. And I think that once we open up that door and people can see how much economic returns they get, um, then naturally more capital will flow uh, into those two sectors. Uh, but right now, it's an abysmal situation, and we cannot change it unless we're intentional. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I makes makes total sense. I think, in addition, you know, you uh, the knock-on effect of that uh, a success of it, even if it is, as you said, a demonstration fund, or if it's either whether it is or it isn't, um, you know, the knock-on effect of seeing uh, those what the other uh, cadre of investment funds who have invested in a certain way. Um, uh, for for uh, as long as they might have, now looking differently or thinking differently about how they should do that, perhaps populating their investment teams differently so that they have, again, a different sort of flow and, and network. Um, I think all those are, are things that will have positive knock-on effects as well. Um, this actually, I think, is a nice uh, lead-in, uh, knowing that we, we've had some of this conversation before. The next question was, what should the city and state be doing that they aren't? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you start with that, and I will allow <laughs> <I> will... <laughs> Well, I mean, I think we've talked. We talked a little bit about um, uh, about the idea of of sort of common infrastructure, um, and, uh, and 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 that that can exist to support a diverse pool of cell and gene therapy companies, for example. Right, the the, the fact that. There's enough shots on goal. There's many different diseases. There's actually different permutations of similar technologies. Um, there are different stages of companies, different capital positions. So you've got a lot of bets, but there's common infrastructure needed. You mentioned manufacturing before. Um, I'll tell, tell a brief story. And we were starting uh, Spark in 2013 when, when I think, by contrast, there was, I don't think there was, I think there were zero cell and gene therapy companies at, at that point in the Philadelphia area. Um, we went to look uh, for clean room space. Uh, because we knew we needed to manufacture in a clean room environment. And we, we basically drew a circle, you know, 50 miles uh, radius around Philadelphia. And we found one, uh, one site, one location that had a clean room environment. Um, and so, you know, that, of course, we, we ended up going and saying, okay, we're going to build it um, from scratch. But I think the more uh, infrastructure exists around, um, you know, capa extra capacity lab space, extra capacity manufacturing space, flex manufacturing space. Um, I think th that supporting the development of that uh, that type of activity, um, you know, is can be extremely important because now that that new idea that that can be started out of University X, Drexel University, or Penn, or Jefferson, or whatever it might be. Um, with three or four or five people, there's some there's some infrastructure there, um, as opposed to perhaps when we began, where we had to we had to spend some of our capital to build that infrastructure. So, I mean, at a high level, that's one area, and I know you'll probably touch on a different one, which is why I thought I would cover that one. <laughs> that's a good one, and I will go back to uh, the earlier comments that I made that we, we function in a capitalist system, 
So yep. I cannot overemphasize the importance of capital. You know, if you think about it, most of us who are in the life sciences and the technology world, we know this, but most people outside don't know it. Most of the basic research that is done throughout our universities is government funded. The basic research, what we do is that we commercialize it. We, we, we move it from a, a purely uh, theoretical basic research to how do you actually create a product out of that, all right? But the, the core of that, uh, before we could even get there, is government funded. Well, if we're doing that to create all these great companies like Sparks and the like, we should be doing likewise using government resources to um, seed um, uh, funds that are intentional on changing the diversity of our capital flow. Um, yep. And I, I would say that if you, it, it, the question was, what can the state and the city do? Well, that's something they can do. They can put resources behind, act as a catalyst to start and, and, uh, and support those who are going to set up a fund that will be focused on making sure that a broader swath of our community get access to capital. And that will, the, the returns on that will be quite significant. Because think about it. I mean, this is a source that uh, is segments of our society that have not gotten capital before. Think about what we can open up there. So I really do think that that's a very concrete thing that state and city governments can do. It's the best utility of capital. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I think it. I mean, it's. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think we'll, uh, we'll we'll sort of end it with that as our last question and as our last thought. Uh, Osagi, great to spend the time um, uh, with with a number of other uh, folks in the room together with us. We've spent a lot of time recently, and um, and I think have uh, have in addition to the work on the task force, even. Um, uh, separately and, and uh, privately, I've appreciated all the, the support you've been, been giving me and us. And, uh, you know, this is a really exciting time. I would just sort of leave with the theme again, the fact that we have um, out of, you know, 130 business leaders and government leaders um, uh, and civic leaders who got together and talked about what does Philadelphia need to do to be uh, successful in uh, recharging and recovering from uh, the impacts of, of COVID-19. Uh, you know, the very first of those things and the one that was specific to his in, in industry was to become a top global cell and gene therapy hub. Uh, and hopefully uh, in our conversation today, we've been able to convince you as the audience on why that is, why Osagi and I are so excited about it and why uh, there's so much more uh, to be done and, and, and to see that, that economic growth um, and recharge come out um, and be led by uh, this, this industry. Um, and to be uh, uh, broad-based in its impact um, on our economy. So, Sagi, I'll leave uh, it to you for any words. Well, look, it's been, a, as usual, Jeff, it's been a blast uh, catching up and talking about this. Um, look, Philadelphia has always been unique. Let's remember what this city is. This is where the Constitution was debated, right? This is where Benjamin Franklin was. Uh, he's the founder of a university that uh, Jeff and I share in common, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, he was an inventor. This city has always been innovative, and it has a long history of that. Innovative across the board, both in the sciences and in, in terms of social policy and government. Uh, so we are, we are simply continuing the tradition of Philadelphia, <laughs> and we're really excited. The trick now is that we need to make sure that all of Philadelphia participates and all of us recover together because that's the way we get the best, most robust, most sustainable form of recovery. So very excited to be part of this effort. Cool. Thank you all. Thanks for the time. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Take care.